So in this lecture, we're going to talk about protozoans. And the first protozoan that we're going to talk about is Trypanosoma brucei. And Trypanosoma brucei has two subspecies. Subspecies Gambensi, which is found in West Africa, and Rodensi, which is found in East Africa. And you don't have to know those for the practical, but the reason I wanted to point them out is because when I talk about the symptoms, we'll talk about how um, the West African sleeping sickness varies from East African sleeping sickness. So the disease that it causes is called African sleeping sickness. And the method of motility is using what's called an undulating membrane. And what that means is if we look at this um, organism, uh, what you're looking at is those pink cells are red blood cells. And in the red blood cells, you see those spirochete looking organisms. That is trypanosoma. And so those little spiral looking organisms move through its undulating membrane, which means it kind of has like a wave-like motion. And so that is how they move. In terms of um, stages that you need to know for the practicum, you need to know the tripomastigote. And the tripomastigote is the stage of the life cycle that is infective to our body. And so this is the one that you get infected by. That is also the one you need to know um, under the microscope. The other stage that you're going to be responsible for is called the epimastigote. And the epimastigote is what develops in the tsetse fly. So how the disease is, is transmitted is that there's two stages to the life cycle. The epimastigote um, multiplies in what's called an intermediate host. Okay, and so intermediate host is where the asexual part of the life cycle occurs. And in the case of um, trypanosoma, the intermediate host is going to be the tsetse fly. And so the epimastigote is going to multiply in the tsetse fly, and it's transformed into what's called the tripomastigote. And this occurs in the salivary gland of the tsetse fly. And so when it matures into the tripomastigote, the tsetse fly will take a blood meal, meaning it will bite a human host and take a blood meal for food. And when it does that, it injects that tripomastigote into the human body. And so what's gonna happen is, is that humans are going to be um, the definitive host. And this is where the sexual part of the life cycle occurs. And so if we look, um, what ends up happening is when the tsetse fly takes a blood meal and it injects the tripomastigote into the body, it goes into the lymph system, to the blood, and eventually would go to the heart and brain. And the brain is the most affected by the organism. And so what ends up happening is, is at the site of the bite, it's going to form this canker, the sore. And so once the organism is injected into the wound and it travels through the lymph system, it's going to go into the bloodstream um, and one of the reasons that this organism is so interesting is that many organisms can't survive in the bloodstream. 
And that's because in the bloodstream, they're constantly bombarded by the white blood cells, which are the cells in your body that are responsible for, um, for fighting off in invaders. And so normally, if an organism is in the bloodstream, they're being bombarded by these white blood cells. In the case of trypanosoma, what makes trypanosoma um, sneaky is that trypanosoma does something called antigenic switching. And what that means is that normally the immune system recognizes these antigens, right, these foreign molecules on the surface. And when the body recognizes those antigens, it'll start to produce antibodies. And those antibodies will attack those antigens. Now, the problem is that trypanosoma is constantly changing its protein expression, changing which antigens it's displaying. And so by the time the body produces these antibodies, trypanosoma has now changed and is expressing different antigens. And so then it takes time for the immune system to recognize those. They start producing antibodies. And again, by the time the immune system responds, it now is explaining um, new antigens. And so this helps this organiz organism to evade the immune system. Now, when the organism is in the bloodstream, one of the problems is, is that when we eat food, right, the food goes in through our digestive tract, and eventually when it gets to the intestines, it's going to diffuse out of the intestines and into the bloodstream. And the blood is going to carry the food throughout the body to all the tissues that need it. Now, your cells need glucose, for example, to make ATP for energy. And so when this organism is found in your bloodstream, instead of your body cells getting the glucose, the organism is instead utilizing the glucose. And so the organism is going to start to use the glucose um, from your blood. And what ends up happening is, is when your cells don't get glucose, they don't make ATP. And so you start to get fatigued, you get really tired and sleepy. And what ends up happening is, is in the late stages of the disease, when it's affecting the brain and the brain is not getting enough glucose, the body basically goes to sleep and never wakes up. And that's why it's called African sleeping sickness, uh, because it causes you to go to sleep, slip into a coma, and then eventually die. And the disease is incurable. So in terms of symptoms, so let's write some symptoms here. Change my ink. So symptoms, one of the first symptoms is going to be that the patient gets a canker, which is a sore at the side of the bite. And so that's gonna form where the tsetse fly bites. Now, tsetse flies are, are um, present during the day, so they take their blood meal during the day. And when they take that blood meal, they're going to form that canker. Now, other symptoms that are common with African sleeping sickness would be fever, headaches, muscle and joint aches, and fatigue. So basically, these are very flu-like symptoms. Um, in terms of the two diseases, East African sleeping sickness progresses very rapidly. After just a few weeks of infection, the parasite will already evade the central nervous system and eventually will cause mental deterioration and other neurological problems. And death usually occurs within months. So death within a few months. In terms of West African sleeping sickness, the disease progresses a lot more slowly. Usually it takes about one to two years before you start to see evidence of the central nervous system involvement. And during this time, 
um, patients start to have other things like personality changes, um, daytime, daytime sleepiness with nighttime sleep disturbances, so their circadian rhythm gets off. Um, the patient will have progressive com confusion. And then other s neurological symptoms such as partial paralysis or problems with balance or walking can occur, as well as hormonal balances as well. The course of untreated infection rarely lasts more than six to seven years and more often kills in about three years. So death usually within three years. And so the West African sleeping sickness is more kind of chronic whereas the East African sleeping sickness is more acute and it comes on very quickly and death usually occurs within a few months. In terms of treatment, so the treatment of this is uh, pentamidine. So pentamidine, okay, so pentamidine is going to be the drug um, that's going to be used for trypanosoma. Um, it's widely available in the U.S., but in Africa where this is more of a problem um, because they have the tsetse flies, it's not as easily available. In terms of diagnosis... So diagnosis is going to rest on finding the parasite. So finding the parasite. In body fluids. Or tissues. by microscopy. So it could be something as simple as doing a blood smear. Like you see up top, you can see these red blood cells. And if you look in the blood, you can see the organism in the blood. Um, if the disease has progressed and they suspect central nervous system involvement, um, it could be something as uh, it could be something like a spinal tap. So looking at the cerebrospinal fluid to see if the central nervous system is involved, and the choice of treatment or drugs depends on the stage of the disease. So depending on how far along it is in the life cycle, um, or how far it is in terms of development in the body, that would dictate what drug is being chosen. And so the cycle continues when the trypomastigote is going to develop in the body, in the humans, the trypomastigote's in the blood, um, another tsetse fly comes along and, it, and takes a blood meal and ingests the trypomastigote. The trypomastigote is going to go through development. It's going to form the epimastigote. And then again, it's going to be transmitted back to humans. And so the cycle is dependent on these tsetse flies. And so this is why um, this is only found, the disease is only found in places where tsetse flies are also found, which is going to be, in this case, in Africa. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is related to a question in your question sets. And it's at question 112 in your question sets. And it asks for another disease caused by trypanosoma. And so another species called trypanosoma cruzi is the cause of what's called South American sleeping sickness or Chagas disease. And so you can guess that this is most prevalent in South America. And this particular organism um, is transmitted by not a tsetse fly, but by something called a reduvid bug. And the reduvid bug is going to be found um, in parts of South America and Mexico. 
and it hides in crevices or cracks of poorly made houses. For example, if the walls are made of mud or thatch roof, etc. Um, this is where the organism would reside. The reduvid bug is nocturnal. And what ends up happening is, is that this organism at night will come out and it goes to take a blood meal. Now, it goes to take a blood meal in places where the skin is the thinnest. So the eyelids, for example, the mouth, etc. And it will use this, what we call proboscis, this needle-like injection. And it will stick you with the proboscis, like in the lips, etc. Um, which is also why the reduvid bug is called the kissing bug. Um, and so it will stab the person in the lips or the eyelids where the skin is thin um, several times while you're sleeping. And it will take its blood meal. And then it's not actually through the proboscis that the organism is transmitted. It's not until the reduvid bug actually finishes with their blood meal. They turn around and they defecate when they're eating. And so what happens is, is, is sometimes the patient inadvertently while sleeping might feel the bug and might go to shoo the bug away. And inadvertently, they actually rub the feces into the wound. And that can cause the swelling like you see in this patient's eye here. The eyelid is very swollen. That's the feces getting into that wound. And that's the beginning of the disease. Um, Acute Chagas disease um, lasts for about four to eight weeks. Um, it occurs usually immediately after infection. Um, and at this stage, the parasite might be found in the blood. Um, during acute disease, the infection could be mild or asymptomatic. There may be fever or swelling around the site of inoculation. So again, where the parasite um, penetrated the skin. Um, Rarely, acute infection can result in severe inflammation of the heart muscle or the brain or in the fluid or lining around the brain. In the case of Chagas disease, following the acute phase, most infected people enter into a prolonged asymptomatic form of the disease. And this is where few or no parasites are actually detected in the blood. And during this time, most people are unaware of their infection. Many people actually remain asymptomatic for their life and ne never develop Chagas-related symptoms. However, an estimated 20 to 30% of infected people will develop debilitating and sometimes life-threatening medical problems over the course of their life. And so some complications of chronic Chagas disease can include things like um, heart rhythm abnormalities that can cause sudden death. Um, it could cause a dilated heart that doesn't pump blood well. Um, a dilated esophagus or colon, leading to difficulties with eating or passing stool. Um, and so in the case of Trypanosoma cruzi, they don't replicate in the blood, only in cells. And so that makes them a little bit different than Trypanosoma brucei. And so this is an example of another species of Trypanosoma that causes disease. So the next organism that we're going to talk about is Toxoplasma gondii, and Toxoplasma gondii causes toxoplasmosis. And toxoplasmosis, mode of motility, is undulating membrane. Just like Trypanosoma. Uh, the stages that you're responsible on the exam is the trophozoite. And the trophozoite looks like a little crescent moon with a nucleus in the middle. And typically you're gonna see that in a blood smear, meaning you'll be able to see the pink red blood cells all around it. And within there, you're gonna find those crescent moons. And the other stage you need to know by name, but you don't need to recognize it, is the oocyst. And the oocyst you should know because that is the stage that is infective to humans. And so in, in toxoplasmosis, um, the sexual phase of the life cycle of toxoplasma happens in the lining of the cat. And cats are the definitive hosts. And in the cats, in the intestines, the 
um, the organism will um, produce oocysts, and those oocysts will be shed in the feces. And cats and kittens can shed millions of oocysts in their feces for as long as three weeks after infection. So how then is this transmitted? The first way that it's transmitted is through consumption of food or water that's contaminated by cat feces or by contaminated environmental samples. For example, changing kitty litter or ingestion of fecally contaminated soil, etc. The second way that it's transmitted is through ingestion of undercooked contaminated meats. And that's because intermediate hosts of toxoplasma include birds, rodents, lambs, pig, cattle. And all of these organisms become infected after ingesting soil, water, or plant material that was contaminated with oocysts. So let's say, for example, a cat um, defecates and these animals then ingest those oocysts. In these intermediate hosts, they develop into something called bradyzoites in the muscle of the animal. And then if you consumed this undercooked contaminated meat, this can lead to infection. And so toxoplasmosis is considered to be the leading cause of death attributed to foodborne illness in the U.S. And then lastly, we have from mother to unborn child in utero. So how the life cycle of toxoplasma works is that when we ingest the oocysts or inhale them, um, the oocysts will germinate on the way to the small intestine and it will release sporozoites. So we go oocysts and those become sporozoites. And the sporozoites will then enter the blood and they will infect other tissues and they will become trophozoites. Become trophozoites. And the trophozoites, this is going to be the asexual part of the life cycle. And so humans are intermediate hosts. So humans are intermediate hosts, just like uh, birds, rodents, etc. And so the asexual part of the life cycle happens in humans, and it forms these trophozoites. And in the human host, the parasite will form these tissue cysts, um, most commonly in the skeletal muscle, in the myocardium, in the brain, and the eyes. And these cysts may remain throughout the life of the host. In terms of symptoms, so let's change ink here. So for symptoms, symptoms of toxoplasmosis usually asymptomatic. However, if symptoms do occur, usually they're mild flu-like symptoms. Um, and that includes things like tender lymph nodes, muscle aches, etc. And these flu-like symptoms may last for weeks to months and then go away. However, the parasite remains in the body in an inactive state. And if this person were to become immunocompromised, like for HIV or AIDS patients, um, if patients become immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, this organism can be reactivated. And in patients who are immunocompromised, this actually can be very severe and lead to death. Um, in immunocompromised, it can cause encephalitis which is swelling of the brain. Um, this also can lead to changes 
in personality in the patients or could lead to death. However, most healthy people recover from toxoplasmosis without treatment. Um, the other group that's at risk, so immunocompromised are at risk, as well as pregnant women. And so pregnant women, if they happen to acquire toxoplasmosis um, while pregnant, again, notice the transmission is from mother to child in utero. And if this happens to, um, if this happens to occur while pregnant, um, she can, or this can lead to a miscarriage or the baby to be born, um, stillborn. However, generally if a woman becomes infected before becoming pregnant, um, the unborn child will typically be protected because the mother has developed immunity. But if she's pregnant and then becomes newly pregnant, infected with toxoplasma during or just before the pregnancy, she can pass the infection to the unborn baby. And so in some cases, infants um, infected before birth sometimes can show no symptoms at birth, but actually can have problems later in life with potential um, vision loss, mental disability, and seizures. And so sometimes it's not always apparent right away that a baby has been infected with toxoplasmosis. And so in the case of um, pregnant females, um, if you're female and you have a cat, you've probably been told by the obstetrician that it's a good idea not to change kitty litter. And that's because, again, cats in the feces transmit those oocysts. And if you happen to um, inhale or ingest those oocysts, that can lead to toxoplasmosis. Now, that usually doesn't mean you can't have a cat. It just means that you shouldn't be the one responsible for changing the kitty litter. And again, that's because it can, in pregnant women, if she acquires it while pregnant, that can lead to death or harm to the fetus. The other thing about toxoplasma is that it's an intracellular parasite that ruptures host cells. And that can also lead to a strong inflammatory response within the host. In terms of treatment, let's change the ink here. So treatment. So typically for treatment, um, it's best if treated in early stages. And the treatment is pyrimethamine. So we have pyrimethamine. Um, we have another drug called uh, sulfadiazine. Etc. And so these are common drugs that are used to treat toxoplasmosis. But again, it depends on when toxoplasmosis is diagnosed. Um, typically, diagnosis, so change ink again here. So, in terms of diagnosis, Typically, it's made through serological tests. Looking for antibody production. So basically seeing, did the body produce antibodies, which is in response to the parasite. Um, what's interesting about toxoplasmosis is that typically the way that cats get it is from infected rodents. And the interesting thing about this is that when the rodents are infected, like mice, for example, um, 
the infection in the rodents typically causes them to lose their normal avoidance behavior towards cats and actually makes them more likely to be caught and thus infect the cat, meaning that instead of running away from the cat, something in their personality changes by the parasite in the brain, and it causes the rodents to go to the cat. And so the cat is going to, um, for example, attack the rodent, and the cat becomes infected by toxoplasma from the mouse, for example. And then the toxo, then the ma or the cat can then transmit it to humans. And so cats actually usually show no sign of infection. And so oftentimes people don't know that their cat is infected. And so that is it for toxoplasma. The last organism that we're going to talk about is Plasmodium falciparum. And Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium vivax or Plasmodium malariae, Plasmodium ovale, all of these cause malaria. Plasmodium falciparum is just going to be the most deadly. Meaning of all the types or all the strains of Plasmodium that cause disease, um, Plasmodium falciparum is the most deadly. Um, in terms of motility, um, Plasmodium moves using a gliding motility. The stages that you are responsible to know are the sporozoites. These are infective to human. You need to know the merozoite, which is released by the liver and will be found in the blood and will infect red blood cells. You should know the ring stage. And so the ring stage looks like a little ring with a dot. Um, and this is the one that you can see inside the red blood cells. And the last one is going to be the Chazant, which is this picture here. It's basically just a multinucleated cell. And so there are four stages that you should know for plasmodium. So the sporozoite, the merozoites, the ring stage, and the Chazant. And of those, you might see the ring stage or the Chazant in the blood smears, which we'll talk about in a minute. The plasmodium um, life cycle includes two hosts. So the first host is the Anopheles mosquito. And specifically, it's the female Anopheles mosquito that transmits it. And this is where the sexual phase of the life cycle occurs. And so what do we call the host that the sexual phase happens in? Again, that is going to be the definitive host. And so the female Anopheles mosquito is the definitive host. And so what happens is, is um, during a blood meal, the malaria infected female Anopheles mosquito, which again is the definitive host, inoculates sporozoites into the human host. So again, uh, the sporozoites will be found in the mosquito saliva. They will bite and take a blood meal and they will transmit the organism to humans. Humans are the intermediate hosts. And so this is where the asexual part of the life cycle occurs. And so what happens is, is the sporozoites go into the blood and um, those sporozoites go and they infect the liver. Now, in the liver, this stage of the reproduction is referred to as um, exoerythrocytic, and that's because an erythrocyte is a red blood cell. And so when you see exoerythrocytic, that means basically that it's outside of the red blood cells, and that means that the cycle occurs um, in the liver. <laughs> 
And so um, sporozoites infect the liver cells and then they mature into um, merozoites and the merozoites are released by the liver. And when the merozoites are released by the liver, um, some make it into the blood and the merozoites then infect the red blood cells. Merozoites, when they infect the red blood cells, can become this ring stage. Um, and this is where we have what we call the erythrocytic cycle. And so when the parasite enters the red blood cells, um, it does asexual reproduction. That's why humans are the intermediate host. And these merozoites infect the red blood cells, um, which goes to the ring stage trophozoites, which goes to trophozoites. Those then mature into the schizonts. And once they form that schizont, that multinucleated cell, this ruptures and it ruptures red blood cells and they develop back into the merozoites. And then the merozoites basically can reinfect red blood cells and the process continues. And so these blood stage parasites are what are responsible for the clinical manifestation of the disease, meaning that this is where all the symptoms come into play. Um, we'll talk about the symptoms in a minute, but basically the symptoms are cyclical and that's because of the cycle. It depends when you are in the cycle for the types of symptoms, um, uh, the type of symptoms that exist. Now, these merozoites can go on to become other forms. And the way that mosquitoes become infected is that another mosquito comes along and it bites an infected human host and it takes a blood meal. And that um, infected human then passes it back to um, the female Anopheles mosquito. And the cycle can keep continuing. In terms of symptoms, so we'll go to the next slide for symptoms. So in terms of symptoms, um, the incubation period in most cases varies, but it's typically about seven to 30 days from when infection occurs until symptoms start to appear. Um, most commonly, the symptoms include fever, chills, sweats, headaches, nausea, vomiting, body ache, and general malaise or fatigue. Um, the symptoms typically come and go every two to three days, and that timing depends on the species causing the disease. Because in some cases, um, sometimes the symptoms, the cyclical part might take two days, some might be three days, etc. Um, and so, in this, these symptoms of malaria, um, there are typically three phases. The cold phase, that's where patients experience chills, like the early signs of a fever. The second phase is the fever stage where they get a spiking fever. And these fevers can become very high and can actually lead to seizures. And then in the last stage of malaria symptoms, um, the patient has a period of sweating and becomes very exhausted and will fall asleep. And so those are the main symptoms um, associated with plasmodium. Um, in 2015, uh, malaria was associated with about 429,000 deaths. So if you think about that, almost half a million people died from malaria in 2015. So it's a big, big problem. Um, in terms of um, treatments, so the age-old remedies of quinine is still used. Um, chloroquine, uh, mefloquine, which is also known as larium. And now there's even a vaccine um, that's available and it's being tested um, kind of more widespread in Africa currently. Um, which has been shown to have some effectiveness. It's not 100%, but it does help reduce the mortality um, from malaria quite a bit. Um, in terms of diagnosis, so in general, malaria, it can be a curable disease if diagnosed and treated promptly and correctly. And so in terms of diagnosis, so diagnosis, 
so diagnosis typically looks is for um, looking for parasites um, in the blood. Usually by microscopy. So basically looking at a blood smear to see if the parasite is found. So in Plasmodium vivax and, in, and Plasmodium vivali infections, um, patients um, that have recovered from the first episode of the illness may suffer several additional attacks, what are called relapses, even after months or years without symptoms. And that's because these relapses occur because those two species have dormant liver stage um, called hypnozoites that may reactivate at later times. And so treatments to reduce the chance of such relapse is available and should follow the treatment of the first attack. So in case the malaria is caused by one of those species that might have um, these dormant stages.